We'll take your copy of Scripture and turn to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to be talking about being thankful today. It's the season of Thanksgiving. And uh, so we want to kind of talk about what does it mean to be thankful. And so the question I want to kind of start with today is this. Do you think God cares about Thanksgiving? Now, I'm not talking about the holiday that we celebrate. I'm talking about us being thankful and grateful. Well, it may surprise you to know that it's actually God's will for your life to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us, In everything give thanks. This is God's will for your life. Over 200 times in the Old and New Testament, we're told to be thankful, to be grateful, to live in thanksgiving, to live in gratitude. And if that's the case, here's a question. Why don't we do that? There's an author named Philip Schaefer. He came up with this uh, really amazing uh, book, and he was talking about how that we as Americans, particularly, but really as the world, we have more things than anybody's ever had. We have more wealth. We have more property. We have more things, and yet we are the least satisfied and the least thankful. And in fact, what he talks about is that it's to the point where nobody's satisfied with anything, and all they can do is grumble and complain. Now, Jeff Foxworthy was a, a favorite comedian of mine growing up, and you might remember he had a thing called You Might Be a Redneck If, right? It was kind of a test to know if you were a redneck or not. Well, I kind of stole that from him, and I'm going to give you a test today. You might be a grumbler if. Are you ready? Let's take our test. Uh, you might be a grumbler if the chip on your shoulder walks in the room before you do. And if you're wondering who I'm talking to, it's probably you right? Uh, you might be a grumbler if you find the dark cloud in every silver lining. You know, you can find every worst possible scenario. You can see the bad in everything. If, if somebody wants to know how bad it is, just let them come ask you, right? Because you'll tell them. You might be a grumbler if you never let anything go, ever. Like, legit, you're still mad about the kid who took the swing from you on the playground 35 years ago. You remember that moment? You remember the clothes that they were wearing? You meant, remember everything that they, they said to you? And you're ready to share that story if anybody will just ask. You might be a grumbler if you never let anything go ever. Oh, did I start meddling already? I'm sorry. You didn't know how that was going to go today, right? You might be a grumbler if you have to share your opinion on everything, whether it was asked for or not. Let me tell you how bad things are. Let me share my opinion with you about everything. You might be a grumbler. You might be a grumbler if you have to point out every flaw that you see. Every flaw you see with every person, every flaw you see with everything, you just have to point out. God's appointed you to point it out. You might be a grumbler. You might be a grumbler if you're convinced that no one has any idea what they're doing. I have a friend, and his favorite saying is, that guy has no idea what he's doing. That company has no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. Like, he's the only one. I'm like, dude, you're not the only person in the world that has an idea of what's going on. But you might be a grumbler. You might be a grumbler if you can't waste, wait to be asked how you're doing. Can't wait for somebody to ask you how you're doing because you're ready to tell them. Well, let me tell you how I'm doing. I'm doing terrible. And here's all the things that are going wrong in my life. So there's a problem that we have. God calls us to be thankful. God commands us to be grateful. God desires us to live with thanksgiving and gratitude. So why don't we? I think the reason that we don't is that there are some things that make it difficult for us to be thankful. And I want to address the problem before we get in the scripture to find the answer today. And I think there's two fundamental problems that we have. So first, this is what we got to find out is, why is being thankful so hard? Why is living in Thanksgiving so difficult? First and foremost, I think it's because we don't fully understand or appreciate God's grace in our life. I think for too many of us, and I've spent a lot of years of my life in this, and maybe, unfortunately, this is exactly where you are right now. You don't understand or appreciate God's grace. So here's what you're doing. 
You're trying to convince God that you're worth saving. And you're trying everything in your power to work off your salvation, to earn your salvation, to make yourself worthy of what God wants to do in your life. And that's not grace. When we act that way, we, we tell God and everybody else, we just don't understand grace. And so I think a lot of times what happens, we come into this place and we sing about grace and we sing about forgiveness, but we leave and go and try to work everything off. I'll show God that I'm worth it. I'll show God that I can earn it. I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna try really hard. I'm gonna change my behavior. And all we ever do is feel burdened by how bad we really are. And we're gonna give you the antidote to that in just a minute. So we don't fully understand or appreciate God's grace, but I also think that we aren't happy with the circumstances of our lives. We look around at our lives and we're unhappy with the things that we see. And a lot of that is because we have a bad theology about who God is and what God does in our life. No matter what church we go to, it seems like that there's this kind of sneaking little theology that sneaks into our life and causes dissatisfaction. It causes hurt and pain. And here's what it is. If God really loved me, things would be better in my life. If I was really good with God, then I wouldn't have any problems. If I check off all the boxes, if I tie, then I'm a church member and I've been baptized, then I should never have any problems in my life, right? My marriage should be strong. My kids should turn out good. My job, I should never lose my job. I should never get sick, right? And so we create this bargain with God that that's how we're going to live life. And so we have this bad theology, and that bad theology fuels this discontent, this dissatisfaction, this living without thanksgiving. And so we're not happy with the circumstances of our life. And here's what we do. Instead of focusing on God, we always focus on what we don't have. We're never content. We're always focusing on what somebody else has that we don't. And and here's the bad thing, isn't it? There's always somebody in our life that we can look at that has more than what we have. I want to let you know a little secret. There are always going to be people in your life that have more than you and have less than you. There are always going to be people in your life that are better off than you and worse than you, and that doesn't make any difference. God doesn't judge you by them. God doesn't judge your situations by their situation, but we do. And so we're never content with what we have. We're always looking at what we don't have. And here's what happens. We get so consumed by what we don't have, we cannot see, we cannot be convinced that there are any blessings that God's given us in our life. We can't be convinced because we're looking at all these other things and we're judging God's work in our life by what he's doing in the life of someone else. And we say, I don't see God working. There's a great old hymn that says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God has done. And unfortunately, when we're in this place, and I've been there, when we're so consumed by what everybody else has, here's what we do. I've got no blessings to count. There's no blessings in my life. There's nothing that God has done. I can't count my blessings because there are none. And here's the sad reality. Why can we not be thankful? Why can we not live in gratitude? Because we see nothing to be thankful for and to be grateful for. And we're never content. We aren't happy with the circumstances of our lives. And so we begin to always look for the next best thing. We're never satisfied. See, that thing of not being content breeds dissatisfaction, and that dissatisfaction begins to breed in our life where we're not satisfied with anything, so we're always looking for the next best thing. I'll be happy when. Now listen, I know we've all said that to ourselves and we've all thought that, but it's a dangerous place to be when you say, I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when we get out of debt. I'll be happy when we have a bigger house. I'll be happy when I get a promotion. I'll be happy when the kids are grown and they they mind us. I'll be happy when my spouse is better. And if you're thinking that, don't share that out out loud, okay? Don't, Don't do that. 
But we always put that little phrase in there, right? I'll be happy when. Have you ever thought about this? What if that when never happens? What if that when never happens? What happens is we will never be satisfied because we're putting our faith, our hope, and trust in something other than God to satisfy us, and that's impossible. So there it is. God calls us to be grateful. God calls us to be thankful. God calls us to live lives of thanksgiving. He commands us in Scripture over 200 times, and what happens is when we're not grateful, when we're not thankful, we become grumblers and complainers. And we begin to look around and think that, that, that we're doing more for ourselves than God is. And so we create these problems where we focus on all the wrong things and wonder why God isn't working. So before we move forward to talk about what the solution to this is, here's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. Is he worthy? Is Jesus worthy of our lives? Is Jesus worthy for us to follow, even if it doesn't work out the way that we think it should? Is Jesus worthy of us to give our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength to to live in purity and holiness when everybody else around us lives how they want to live? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our thanksgiving? Now, until you answer that question, all of this is just going to be information. Until you answer the question whether Jesus is worthy or not, this is just words. And I want you to understand, true thanksgiving means thanks living. See, listen, thanksgiving isn't about turkey. It isn't about dressing. It isn't about football games. It isn't gathering our dysfunctional families together and wondering why we fight. Thanksgiving is a moment-by-moment, situation-by-situation reality where we give thanks to Jesus with all of who we are. It's not a time of year. It's a way of life. And so Paul wants to give us some instruction on some things that need to change in our life for us to be thankful, for us to be grateful for us to live lives of thanksgiving that honor and glorify him and God. So look with me in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and that's where we're going to start today. So, at those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive others. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him. To God the Father. Did you hear it? Thankfulness, thankful, thanksgiving, thanks. All of these are intimately and intricately tied to our relationship to Jesus. And so as we move forward, I want us to think about what would it look like to truly live out thanksgiving in our lives? What would it look like? How would we feel? How would the world around us be impacted if we truly lived out thanksgiving? Well, Paul starts in a place that you may not expect. Here's what he says. One of the things that needs to happen is we need to wear a new wardrobe. We need to completely change the clothes that we're wearing. In verse 12, he says, put on Christ. In the verses before this, Paul goes to great length to talk about how our old life and our sinful nature are clothes that we wear, and that we should take them off and put on Christ. And so here's what he's saying. We need to wear a completely new wardrobe, and we need to take off the sin that keeps us from looking like Jesus. I mean, everything that he talks about here, anger, gossip, Sexual immorality, cheating, 
Just all sorts of different sin. Here's what he's saying. Stop wearing those things. Those are not the clothes that you need to be wearing, and they don't make you look like Jesus. And so why do we wear them? We've been made completely new in Christ. We've been washed clean in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. But yet we make a choice to put these clothes back on. I can think of two reasons why we do that. One is to fit in. For some reason, we want to fit in to the world around us. And so we wrap ourselves in these sins so that we can look like the world, we can sound like the world, and we can fit in to the world. We want to look like them. We want to be like them. We want to act like them. When Jesus says, no, I want you to stand out from them. I want you to be different. I want you to look different. I want you to act different. And yet we do that to fit in. It's almost like we've become secret agents and we've put on a disguise so that we can live in this world so nobody knows that we've been transformed. Put it on to fit in. Another reason that we wear this inappropriate clothing is we want to flatter ourselves. We wrap ourselves in these sins to make us feel good to hold on to the positions of power that we have, to hold on to, you know, some glory that maybe we had in our life or to project this image of strength. And so we hide ourselves in these sins and we walk around with these sins and we tell everybody, you know, does this make me look good? Do do I look good in this? And you know, don't you hate that dreaded question when somebody comes to you and say, does this flatter me? Does this make me look good? And what do you want to say? No, no right? But we do the same thing. Here's what Jesus is saying. Listen, stop wearing the things that make you look nothing like me. Stop wearing the things that emphasize the worst part of who you are. Stop wearing the things that I saved you from, that I delivered you from. Stop wearing those things. Instead, he says, put on. So then, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, also forgive others. Beyond all these things, put on love. He wants us to put on love and victory from him. He wants us to take off the sin that keeps us from being like Jesus and looking like Jesus. And he wants us to put on the love and victory that only come through him. Now, here's something you may have missed, and I love this about the analogy that Paul uses here. Here's what he's saying. The things in your life, the sin and the brokenness and the fear and the doubt and the baggage and all that kind of stuff, if you want it to change, it's as simple as changing a shirt. It's as simple as stripping off some socks. Take it off. Unfortunately, we believe the lie that our heart and the enemy tells us that you're enslaved to this. You can't get away from it. You're never going to be free. And Jesus says, no, take it off. Take it off and put on my forgiveness. Put on my love. Put on my victory. Everything that he talks about, kindness and gentleness and compassion and all these things in us only happen when the victory of Jesus has come inside of us. And so what Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to put on these things and walk around in the world with your head held high because you're walking in my victory. People should notice that there's something different about you. One of my favorite things that happened in my life, I didn't Realized it then, but I look back on it now, and it's one of my favorite things. When I became a Christian, people began to say things to me like this. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I I remember I had seen a friend of mine. It's been a lot of years since I'd seen him. In fact, I became a Christian, spent some time, you know, working in the church, got called into ministry, went off to college and seminary, and I saw him. And, And he, like two minutes in the conversation, he looks at me and he was like, what is wrong with you, man? You used to be a jerk. And I'm like, you're right. I used to be. 
And then Jesus came into my life and he changed me. What you're seeing in my life is what Jesus can do with a ruined and broken sinner. And that's what he wants to do for you too. Listen, if you're struggling today, and here's the reality, we all are. If you're struggling with something today, here's the hope that you need to hear. You can strip that off out of your life as easy as you change your shirt. And you can put on the forgiveness and victory of Jesus. And you can walk out of here today with your head held high and walk around proud at what Christ has done in your life. That's for you. But you got to change some clothes. You know, what's funny about this analogy is Jesus is making the distinction that we walk around in these dirty, torn rags and try to pretend that they're a three-piece suit. And he says, listen, turn that stuff in. Let it go. I'll never forget when I was kind of going into my first ministry position, uh, the church that I was working at required that I wear a suit all the time. And so I had to go buy suits because I didn't have any. And I went in and I got fitted for my suit and all that kind of stuff. And I'll never forget, you know, feeling like a big boy. You know, I'm, I'm finally an adult. I'm buying a suit. And, and I put on my big boy suit and I walk out and I felt like $10 million. I felt, I felt grown up. I felt important. I felt all these things because I had changed from these dirty rags into this wonderful gift. And that's what Jesus is saying. Listen, it's time to let go of your dirty rags and let me dress you in my righteousness. But you gotta change some clothes before you can be thankful. You will never be thankful. You will never live in gratitude as long as you are covered and wearing your sin. And he says, listen, Thanksgiving is thanks living, and one of the ways that we do that is let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Do you see that? Let Christ peace rule, and you'll be thankful. Peace, thanksgiving. Peace, thanksgiving. And this is very personal for me. This is one of those places in the sermon where God has really been working in my life for a lot of years. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Man, for a lot of years, I've wasted a lot of time in my early Christian walk. I've wasted a lot of time as an early in my ministry chasing God's peace. Everything that I did was to prove to myself and to God and others that I, had, that I was worthy to be saved. Oh, I sang about grace, and you do too, and I sang about forgiveness, and you do too, but I just didn't really believe it. And so I was constantly chasing peace. And I want you to hear today what God spoke clearly to me in his word. I want you to hear it. Are you ready? Stop it. Stop it. Stop chasing what you already have. We are are chasing after peace. We are killing ourselves to be right with God. And yet God says, I have already bought and paid for your peace in Jesus. Colossians 1, 19 through 21, it says that Christ made peace with God through the blood of his cross. And because of that, we are holy and blameless and above reproach before God. Tim Lee told me this, and I I, I told him I was going to steal it and use it. And so here it is. He said, the thing that you need to tell people today is this. God has already bought and paid for their peace. They can take it home with them. It's theirs. God has already bought and paid for your peace. Take it home and live in it. And part of living in that peace, resting in God's peace, is this freedom to be a peacemaker and a peace sharer. Something amazing began to happen when I stopped trying to find peace in my life and just rested in the peace that God had given me. When I, when I stopped trying to work it off and try harder and be better and I just rested in that, you know what happened? The moment that I stopped, the peace that passed all understanding began to fill my heart and my mind. Isn't that crazy? 
I'd been fighting for it. I'd been scratching for it. I'd been dying for it, and I couldn't have it. And as soon as I stopped and rested, there it was. And on the flip side of that, the moment I began to live, rest in that peace, God began to open up things in my life for me to be a peacemaker. I never understood that when Jesus said, be a peacemaker. I never felt like I could because I had no peace in my life. How in the world can I make peace in other people's life when I have no peace in my life? And when I stopped running and I stopped trying and I surrendered to the peace, all of a sudden it began to flow out of me. And here's, what, here's how that worked. I began to go to people in my life who I'd wronged. God was just bringing them to my heart and mind. I began to go to them and here's what I would say. Hey, listen, I know it's been a while, but I've recognized the hurt and pain that I've caused you. And I'm here to ask you to forgive me. Now, you're not required to forgive me. That's your choice, but I'm asking. Some did, some didn't. But God began to open up avenues in my life where I could be a peacemaker. And I could go to people in my life and say, listen, you hurt me. You may not have intended that. You may not know that, but you hurt me deeply. And so here I am to tell you, I forgive you. You're off the hook. You're forgiven. You are free. Resting in God's peace gave me the freedom in his peace to go out and make peace with other people. And as that was happening, God gave another wonderful blessing that I never expected. He gave me the opportunity to share his peace with other people. It has been my privilege in my life to be able to share God's peace with so many people. And this isn't building me up. This isn't like I'm anything special. This is just God's plan for all of us. When we rest in his peace and we become peacemakers, all of a sudden we get these opportunities to be across from people as they're sharing their hurt and pain. And we can just smile and say, listen, I, I know what you're searching for. I know what you're looking for. His name is Jesus. Jesus. Let me tell you how Jesus brought peace to me. Let me tell you how Jesus healed that relationship and how Jesus washed away my sins and how Jesus did this. We become a peacemaker and a peace sharer. And then he says, to let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Verse 16 let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Did you catch that? It's beautiful. That something amazing happens when God, God's word begins to dwell in our heart and our life. God's world doesn't sit still. It's not just information that you put in your brain. Here's the thing. Here's the scary thing you need to understand when you come and you hear God's word and you read God's word for yourself. It's alive. It's alive and it gets inside of you and it starts changing your DNA. It genetically modifies you into something new, a new creation in Christ. It begins to change your thoughts. It begins to change your heart. It begins to change your actions. And the cool thing, this is what it says, it changes us to the point where it creates a new song inside of us that has to come out. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And then you're going to have psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. God changes the very tune of your heart. He changes the radio station, if you want, and tunes you into him. And when he tunes you into him, we begin to resonate with who he is and what he loves. All of a sudden, we just see this joy everywhere in our heart and life. The beautiful music of God working. And it's not just that. It talks about teaching and admonishing. God's word will not sit still. It'll start to percolate up in your life and appear. And, you know, I, I heard this cliche when I was a kid, and I, I didn't really understand it. In fact, it kind of scared me a little bit. But this cliche that would say, you know, there will be some time in your life when you get older that you turn into your parents. And as a kid, I'm like, that's a legit thing. That can happen. Like, I'm just going to turn into my dad or my mom. And we all know what they mean, right? 
At some point in your life, you're going to start saying things like your parents said things. You're going to start acting like your parents because of the influence they've had in your life. Well, this is what he's talking about. When God's word dwells inside of us, we begin to say things like our father would say them. Those moments where we're talking in a conversation and all of a sudden God's word just kind of pops out. And, and we're shocked as much as anybody. Like, where'd that come from? I didn't even know that I knew that. It's because God's word is dwelling inside of you. And I want you to see the correlation again. Where God's word dwells, thankfulness comes. And then he says in verse 17, to do everything in the name of Jesus and be thankful. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. What does it mean to do something in Jesus' name? Well, we're told to pray in Jesus' name, and I think these things are the same. What it means is to do things the way that Jesus would do them. And I want you to think of this as an opposite illustration. What would it look like to have road rage in Jesus' name? What would it look like to tell someone where to go and what to do with themselves in Jesus' name? What would it look like to be unkind and unforgiving and holding on grudges and never forgiving anybody in Jesus' name? Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? See, here's the whole point of giving thanks. Is that we're to approach every moment, we're to approach every situation, we're to approach every person in our life in the name of Jesus. We are to love our spouses the way that Jesus would love our spouses. We're going to raise our children and parent them the way that Jesus would. We, we really just kind of sit there and think about, okay, God, what would you do? Jesus, what would you do in this situation? We know what he would do. To be honest with you, the only time that I really think about doing things in Jesus' name, unfortunately, is after I've blown it. That moment where I flipped out on my kids and yelled too much, you know, and just showing a really bad example. That moment I've said something stupid and inappropriate. That moment that I've just completely messed up in my life. I start to think about that. And I have this picture of Jesus sitting right here next to me looking at me going, dude. Dude, really? And that's where I have to snap out of it because that's not how Jesus would react. It's unfortunate, isn't it? All of you resonated with that picture. You felt the same thing. You're like, yeah, I know what that feels. And here's the problem. That's not what Jesus would do. How would Jesus respond to that situation? Well, in that moment, as we feel guilt and shame and we turn to him and say, God, I'm sorry, here's what he'd say. I forgive you. I don't condemn you. And there's nobody here that's gonna condemn you. Get up, go, and sin no more. Doesn't that sound more like Jesus? Listen, to be thankful, to be grateful, to live in thanksgiving means to do things in Jesus' name. It's not enough just to say it or to try to act that way. It's what he wants is for us to be that way. And then it says that when we do this, we give thanks to God. And I'm thankful that it ends this way because I, I think it's an important analogy that we need to hear. <clears throat> How do you think God feels when he sees his children doing things the way that Jesus does? Let me tell you how I think. I think he's like a proud parent. You know, I, I'm an evil, rebellious father who has kids. But even in my rebellion, I see my kids do amazing and wonderful things. I see them help people. I see them be kind and compassionate. I see them, 
you know, tell people about Jesus. And in those moments, I'm proud. I'm proud for them. I'm proud to see that. And I, take, I just love that. And me being evil, feeling that way, how do you think God, who is good, feels that way? How do you think he feels when he sees us as his children really making attempts? Now, we're not always going to be right. We're not always going to be perfect and we're going to fail. But he really sees us making an attempt to look, to love, to live like Jesus. Doing everything in his name. I think he rejoices over that. I think, and this is just my personal opinion and it's not worth anything. I think he looks around at the angels like, that's my kid. That's my kid. You see him? That's my kid. That's my kid. So here's the question today. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of enough for you to change your life? Is God worthy of you setting aside those filthy rags that you've been wearing and letting him clothe you in his righteousness and truth? Is Jesus worthy of you finally being obedient? Giving your life to him in salvation and letting him change you from the inside out. Taking steps of faith, being baptized, joining the church, finding a place to use the gifts he's given you to love and serve him. Is he worthy enough for that? Is he worthy enough for you to live in thanksgiving even when it's gonna cost you and challenge you? I know the answer to that question in my life. You have to answer that question for yourself. Let's pray. Father, you are worthy. And I pray right now that you would just speak to us and help us to respond, to to trust and rest in the grace that you've already given us to run to you, to be healed and forgiven and set free, to surrender, surrender in faith and take those steps that we need to take to be right. Father, whatever needs to happen today, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and give us the grace and the courage to step out in faith and respond to you. We ask that now in Jesus' holy and precious name. It's in his name we pray. Amen.